Being in the back of that cave, day after day after day, not being able to see anything, your eyes fighting to adjust, and you're not 100% sure anybody knows where you're at. And then nine days later, they see a light. Two Navy SEALs popped up out of the water and the little boys realized they had hope. I want you to imagine for just a moment what you would feel like if you had been in complete darkness and all of a sudden you see this light. How would that make you feel? Here's what I want us to do. I want us to leave the boys there for just a, a moment or two. And I want you and I to walk out get outside of the cave, and I want us to look around, not in Thailand, but in our own country. Because here's what I want you to understand as we begin this evening. If you really stop and look at what's going on in our country, folks, we're living in a very dark time in history. You think about what they're doing with all kinds of products these days. My brothers and I, I had two older brothers, they were four years older than I was, they were twins. We used to fight over cereal. The reason we would fight over cereal is because there was a prize in the bottom. And we wanted whatever little cheesy prize that was. Guess what, today, they're not hiding prizes, they're actually encouraging our children to choose their own pronoun. Kellogg just last year put out a brand new cereal celebrating transgenderism. It's not just Kellogg's. How about Blue's Clues? Very well known kids' cartoon. Just this last year, they had a not only a, a gay pride parade, but they had a grand marshal who was, you guessed it, transsexual. See, over and over what we're starting to see 
is all of this stuff wrapping itself around normal Christian families. Several years ago, James Dobson wrote a book called Children at Risk, in which he said this, Nothing short of a great civil war of values rages today throughout North America. Two sides with vastly differing and incompatible worldviews are locked in a bitter conflict that permeates every level of society. He's right. And in fact, many years earlier, Paul had written about what we're seeing going on in our culture today. If you've got a Bible, let me encourage you, open it up, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let me kind of set the stage for you. This is going to be one of the last books that Paul is writing. He is in a dark, dank prison in Rome. He's writing to one of his best friends, a young mentee who, who he would have mentored along the way, a young preacher by the name of Timothy. He says this, but, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Now, as I read that to you tonight, I, I hope that you realize a lot of those things that Paul was throwing out are very real and very relevant today. We have people who, let's be honest, they love themselves. We, we're in the selfie culture. People have their own page. It, it's ironic to me today, I, I talk to young people where you used to ask them, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they would say things like, fireman. Or they might say, an attorney or a doctor. Or if they were a, a math nerd like Tracy over here, they would say engineer, something, you know. Today, they want to be an influencer. And for those of you who aren't sure what that is, that means they want to make sure their social media is viewed by so many people that they're actually getting paid for it. In other words, they think that highly of themselves, that they're now narcissists. He says, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, disobedient to parents, despisers of good, over and over and over what we see is Paul's words are quite literally being rolled out in front of us today. Example, any of you remember Sesame Street when you were young? Even Sesame Street has now gotten in on the act trying to promote this LGBTQ agenda. It's not just them. The state of California has submitted a bill that would make pedophilia not a crime, but a sexual orientation. Now, what's the big deal with that? Big deal with that is, as I research culture, here's what I know. If they pass this legislation, that would mean folks could then drive school buses, work in daycares, work in the school system, because after all, that's now their gender, so to speak. Now, if you think that's crazy, please understand. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook tells our kids there are 59 possible genders out there. 59. Folks, our kids are growing up in a world of chaos. When you've got drag queen story hour coming to libraries all across the nation, and please don't think this isn't happening in Tennessee, I know of two libraries that they've already been, one of which they've been twice. By the way, toy companies, they jumped in on the act. Used to be you could go and, and buy a Barbie doll and that was normal. Today, we have to have gender neutral dolls. You think it's having an effect? 
Oh yeah, there's a 4,000% increase in children identifying as transgender in 2018, and that number is doing this. Now, if that stat doesn't wake you up, hopefully this one will. In the year 2007, there was a single clinic in the United States that would perform sexual reassignment surgeries in children, in minors under 16. Today, there's roughly 50. Now folks, let me just go out on record and tell you, anybody willing to do that to a minor, that's child abuse. And yet, it's happening. All over our nation, what I'm seeing is Satan gathering up as many as he can to battle Christian homes. And so tonight, what I want us to do is I want us to get real for just a minute. And I want us to talk about six areas that I think he is specifically attacking Christian homes. And here's how I kind of want you to view it. If you can imagine for just a moment, you building this, this hedge around your house, and all of a sudden, an octopus starts to put a tentacle through one of the windows of your house. And about the time you realize there's a tentacle coming in that window, you realize there's another one coming in your back door. And you realize there's one wrapped around your garage. And little by little what you realize is your family is being choked out by all these tentacles from Satan. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to expose them. We're going to talk about how do you pull them off and how do you make sure that your family really is protected. The first one is pornography. I don't like to talk about it. I will go ahead and preface this by saying we're going to talk about it on a very high level because I understand there's probably some young ears in the room. But the reason why I'm starting with this one is because I'm going chronologically. What do I mean by that? Well, what's the average age that a child usually first views pornography? Believe it or not, the average age is eight. Eight years old. If they've got older brothers and sisters or cousins they're close to, guess what? The number goes down. Eight years old. And so by age eight, here's what we're seeing. We're seeing Satan wrap his tentacles around folks. A lot of times parents don't even realize this battle is happening. They don't realize that the porn industry is purchasing every URL, every website they can that is related to every Disney film, every cartoon. In fact, anytime Pixar comes out with a new movie, guess what the porn industry does? They buy every misspelling of it, every character's name in it. Why? Listen to what Jonathan Van Noren says. Companies like Pornhub have actually taken to tagging hardcore porn videos with names of children's cartoon characters like Dora the Explorer or Paw Patrol so that children searching the internet for innocent subjects will end up on their websites filled with degradation and rape. The earlier children get addicted, the more porn they watch. The more porn they watch, the better it is for companies like Pornhub. Their bank accounts bulge with stolen innocence. Folks, average age they start Eight. What do you think that does to future marriages and future Christian homes? You see, it's a problem. And it's a tentacle that we need to wake up and realize is real. 90% of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed internet pornography. They're just one click away. Now, when I talk about it and I approach it, I come at it from a scientific perspective. Because I studied the brain, I studied neurology in school, and here's what I know. When I first entered school, they thought the brain was hardwired after you got past about age 18. Then they learned, no, 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 the brain's actually plastic. It, it can change and alter, and it does, according to what you expose it to. And so you actually form new connections according to what you see, what you hear, 
And so quite literally, your brain is actually wired according to what you're thinking about. Which, by the way, may be why Paul wrote these words in Philippians chapter 4. When he said, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, just, pure, lovely, or good report. He says, if there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, what? Think on these things. Why? Because you're wiring the brain the way God wants it to be wired. And that's a big deal. Because the reality is pornography alters that wiring. Oh, and add to that, it gives our young people a false reality of what marriage is supposed to be like. And so we got a lot of 20s, 30-year-old Christian couples whose marriages right now are on the rocks because one or both of them have been addicted to this. It's not just a, a case now of, of putting it away or stopping watching it. Think about this for just a minute. If you physically rewire the brain, what that means is in order to break the addiction, you've got to rewire it back because you've messed up the whole pleasure center of your brain how bad is it a friend of mine by the name of josh mcdowell did the largest study that's ever been done in this area and one of the things he did was he polled young people and he asked them which one of these things do you think is worse he had them rank several things notice 88% viewed taking something that belongs to somebody else as wrong, as immoral. Here's the problem. Young people ranked not recycling worse than viewing internet pornography. Now, take that and add to it what's going on in the church. And that is... We're, we're looking at not triple X movies, but rather soft porn. Things like Game of Thrones, Fifty Shades of Grey. So follow me for just a minute. We come into a place like this on a Sunday, and we're singing, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and then that night we're watching something like Game of Thrones. Folks, do you see the problem? Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. How bad is porn? It increases marital infidelity by more than 300%. In fact, 56% of all divorce cases involve at least one person having an obsessive interest in pornography. Okay, folks, listen to me very carefully. If 56% of marriages are dissolving because of this, we probably need to be addressing it in the church. We probably need to be making sure our children know it's out there and not just to turn it off, but how to defend themselves against it. I've taught my four kids at this point, I wish that I could put a hedge around them and we've got filters on our devices. But I've taught them, hey, there's probably going to be a time where you're faced with it. Now let's talk about how you deal with that situation. How do you be a Christian warrior and not just give in? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 18, says, Flee sexual immorality, every sin that a man does outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, for you're not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Lastly, Psalm 119, verse 37 says, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. Revive me in your way. So the first tentacle that we've got to remove, that we've got to identify, get rid of, make sure is not choking out our own families is pornography because not only will it destroy things then it can destroy families in the future number two 
We got a lot of young people today who think living together, that's not that big a deal. You know, cohabitation, what, what's, what's wrong with that? <laughs> In fact, we now have churches who are wrestling with, do we throw this couple a shower because they're having a child even though they're not married? Well, folks, let me tell you something. If the church is wrestling with that right there, it tells me that we have totally abandoned and forgotten what's an abomination to God. Last time I checked, we're supposed to keep the marriage bed pure. And the Bible's pretty clear about the order that we're supposed to be doing things. This is from the U.S. Census Bureau. Living with an unmarried partner is now common for young adults, and yet over and over again what we're seeing is Christian homes are being desensitized. It's not that big a deal. 725% increase since the 1960s. There are some of you in this room, had you suggested to your parents, hey, I'm going to go shack up with my boyfriend or girlfriend, you wouldn't have made it out of the house alive. You'd still be scraping yourself up off the kitchen floor, right? And yet today, not that big a deal. If you have a Bible, please open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, I want you to notice the divinely laid down order that Paul gives this young man. When he says, therefore I desire the young women, widows, marry, bear children, and manage or guide the house. He says, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. But notice, notice that order. We're to marry first, then what? Then bear children. And yet, over and over again, what I'm seeing statistically, our kids don't really think you need to be married. Birth rates for unwed girls, age 15 to 19, up 200% since the 1960s. In fact, Pregnancies are actually up 553% in that same category. And some of you look at me and say, wait, time out, Brad. Your math doesn't jive. How could pregnancies be up 553% if birth rates are only up 200? Well, that would be because in 1973, we passed Roe versus Wade, right? We legalized abortion, which means now a pregnancy does not always equate a birth. Moms and dads, listen to me. We have Christian young people who are actively using abortion as birth control. Shame on us. We got to go back and teach the sanctity of human life. Out of wedlock births as a percentage of all births has gone up every single year. In fact, let me update my, my calendar for you here, my chart. As of last year, 40.5% of all children born in the United States go home to just one parent. 40%. Now, why is that a big deal? That's a big deal for two reasons. Number one, because God instituted the family. And number two, have you ever looked at what really happens when you take a father out of the home? Take a look. 63% young people who kill themselves, they're coming from homes without a dad. 71% of high school dropouts coming from homes without a father. 85% of the young people in prison right now, as I'm talking to you, they're coming from homes without a father. And yet, here's the reality. That number... That percentage is only going in one direction. As Christian parents, we need to realize this is a tentacle that is killing Christian homes. And we need to teach our kids against it. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 says this, My son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother. I love the book of Proverbs, but please understand, this is a book giving wisdom to a, a son, and he's saying, you need to hear it from both of us, mom and dad. 
And by the way, dad's in this room. Not only do you still need to be around and stick in your marriage, you also need to be the leader of your home. Amen? Number three. Third area that I think is where we're being choked out, where, where Satan is wrapping tentacles around us. We've got young people today who, they don't want to get married. And what I mean by that is, basically they're looking around and they're saying, nah, it's not for me. And so we've got more young people than in the history, since they've been recording this thing, who are single. Now, multiple things going on here. Number one, I think they're looking around congregations and they're seeing parents who quite literally look like they just sucked a bunch of lemons and don't look happy. And they're thinking, why do I want to do that? Number two, they see a whole lot of marriages end in divorce. And they realize the ripples of divorce are long-lasting. Like, for instance, a child whose parents get divorced at, say, age 14, 15, and, and all of a sudden it's graduation time, high school graduation, should be that child's happiest day, and yet they're scratching their head wondering, do I invite mom or dad to graduation? Do I put both their names on my graduation announcement? Fast forward a few years, college graduation, or, or how about this, wedding day. Should be their happiest day, and yet they're sitting there scratching their head going, okay, we, how are we going to do this with a photographer? You see the ripples? Add to that things like this, Thanksgiving holiday, Christmas. Where are we going to be? Who are we going to spend and who are we not going to spend that holiday with? And you start to realize divorce is not a one-time thing. The ripples keep on going. Why is this one a big deal? This one is a big deal to me because we've lost sight of the fact that God is the one who instituted marriage. And folks, if God instituted it, then it is good our kids need to understand, by them rejecting marriage, they're ultimately rejecting an institution that God himself formed. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, or for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, let me just go out on a limb here and point out something that hopefully you're starting to put together and you're seeing why these really are tentacles. I've talked to a lot of young ladies in their 20s. They want to get married. There's a lot of them who would love to be a Christian wife, a, a, a mother. And they told me, went to a Christian university, Brad. You know what all the young guys are doing at Christian universities? Looking at pornography. Interesting. They want to get married but they realize they don't want to start their marriage on that foundation. Add to that, we're waiting longer than ever to actually get married. Average age for a male to get married in the United States of America, we are now at about 32. 32 years old. Now, why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because what that really means is we got a lot of young men who are putting off responsibility until they're in their 30s. In fact, if you look at this chart, I know this is really detailed, it's really complex. Actually, I made it in about two minutes. I wanted to keep it simple. My wife always tells me, keep it simple, right? You realize the term teenager is a relatively new term. We, we didn't used to have that. Kids will go from being children to being a man or a woman. So a 13-year-old boy, for instance, he'd hang out with his mom until they realize, okay, he's now old enough to go out and work with his dad, and that transition was from boy to a man. 
Today we got this new term, teenager. You know what we, we expect from a teenager? Honestly, about the only thing we really expect from them in the church is we want them to go in the water. We don't expect them to give. We don't expect them to do any kind of discipling. Basically, as long as they get wet, we're good to go. Then comes college. And guess what? The expectations get even less. And here's what I hear over and over and over from parents. I just hope my child stays faithful while they're at school. Folks, I don't just hope my children stay faithful while they're at school. I want them evangelizing other people while they're at school. Then we got post-grad. A lot of kids these days wanting to go into nursing school or, or medical school or law school or get their master's. And so here's the reality. We're not putting any expectations or responsibilities on them, both in the church and at home. And as a result, I'm seeing a lot of young men who are not developing into Christian leaders. In fact, when you look at a list like this, where in the past you would have young men who who at age 13, 14, they were ambassadors, captains of ships. They were earning all kinds of awards in their teens. And then you fast forward to today where our children's highest award is like a high score on a video game. Folks, that's a problem. And it's something parents need to deal with. By the way, while we're talking about them not wanting to get married, Married, maybe it's because we're disparaging marriage. You ever heard somebody talk about that old ball and chain? Well, folks, remember, God instituted marriage. And when you disparage marriage, what you're disparaging is an institution that he himself started. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing. And obtains favor from the Lord. My generation, we were told this. You need to make sure you get all of your schooling done before you get married. Anybody remember hearing that? There's some of you right now thinking, yeah, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, out of one side of their ear, they're hearing this. You need to remain pure and holy, and you need to make sure that you don't, you know, have, have premarital sex and do anything. But then we also want you to just go on and finish all your school. You don't want to be tied down to a marriage. Folks, which one is more important, your spouse or your schooling? Think about it. Husbands, you are to love your wife like Christ loved the church. Wives, you, according to Scripture, older women are to admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children. Now, I've pointed this out multiple times to multiple people, including my wife, because I told her, I said, that, that means there may be times where I'm not really lovable. Like when you walk in the bedroom and my clothes are still on the floor that you've asked me to pick up a hundred times. But here's what this really means. This means we need people in this room who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who have been there and got the t-shirt to talk to the young ladies in their 30s and 40s. And let them know, you know what? There are going to be times you really would like to choke him. But don't. Instead, love him. And I'm going to say something that will probably offend a couple of people in this room, but that's okay. <laughs> it's scripture. When the Bible says older women are to teach younger women, here's what that really means. That means the older women, i.e. 50s, 60s, and 70s, are supposed to be teaching the younger 20s and 30s and not the other way around. In too many congregations, we got young ladies in their 30s teaching people in their 60s. Folks, that's not what this scripture's talking about. This is talking about ladies who are seasoned with life, who've had children maybe leave the nest, and they're able to give wisdom to younger ladies. 
Number four, I think the fourth tentacle that is choking out our families and that is really going to mess up some future homes is we're confusing gender roles. Just how bad is it? Listen to me, church. When you've got a person who is born a female, transitioned to be a male, and is now wanting to serve as an elder in the Lord's church, that's a problem. It starts really young. In fact, they've got all kinds of cartoons and drawings and, and different things. School's now telling the students, hey, don't call them a boy or a girl. Why? Because after all, the, they may choose to be something else. To them, they say gender is fluid. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to think about a young person today who is going to school and they are being read books like these. Or, or books like these. By the way, there's a whole bunch of them. About 10, 15 years ago, I did a series on same-sex marriage. And, and I totally wiped out the whole idea of a gay gene. I was blown away that there was 36 books that had been mailed free of charge to every public library in this country, all supporting that same-sex marriage agenda. A couple of years ago, I realized, you know what? This is what's really on the forefront right here. I didn't think there would be that many books already targeting our kids about transgenderism, and yet, guess what? They're there. From toddler to teen. This evil is being promoted as good to our children. If you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open it up to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. I want to I make a couple of points with you just to clear this one up. Because it's my hope and prayer again. When you get home that you can rip this tentacle off and it will not be choking out your family. Number one, God is described as our maker all throughout the Bible. He's described as our creator seven times and our maker 18 times in scripture. So God made us. Psalm chapter 95 verse 6 says, Oh come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Point number two, our maker created males and females. He didn't create a whole bunch of 59 different types of genders. He created two. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Number three. God, who was our maker, who created males and females, then commanded them to reproduce. In fact, if you look in Scripture, this is really the very first command that God gives mankind. He says, be fruitful and multiply. I put on here, notice in verse 31, that God's creation, male and female, is described at the end of its creative activities. He says it's not just good, it's very good. Next, God created man and woman. So we see male and female in Genesis chapter 1. Then we turn to Genesis chapter 2, and he starts using terms man and woman. In fact, he tells us more specifically how they were created, and he starts giving them roles. He created man. Look in verse 15, 16. He's going to be working and tending in the garden. Jesus also spoke to it in Matthew chapter 19. He spoke about the creation of man and woman. He said this, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. 
So here's what I learned from Scripture. The Bible uses no other words besides males, females. And while men and women in Scripture may express differing amounts of masculinity and femininity, Scripture still operates with the binary category of men and women. In fact, at the end of the day, a male of Genesis 1 is the man of Genesis 2. Here's the problem. Our culture says, okay, yeah, there's two biological sexes, male and female. But gender, they say, is something totally different. They say gender is what you feel. And so, in other words, if I told you tonight, I feel like a 70-year-old, 5-foot Asian woman. Hopefully you would be looking at me right now like I've lost my mind. Because am I a 70-year-old, 5-foot Asian woman? No. But according to our culture, if I feel that, that's what I am. I don't have to tell you this is even now sneaking its way into sports where if somebody feels like they're a female, they can compete with the females. Well, again, the Bible doesn't separate the concepts of biological sex and gender. If you look back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says he created him, male and female, he created them. Then flip over to Genesis chapter 2 and look starting in verse 22 where it uses words like man and woman. And here's what you realize. Genesis chapter 1, the male is the same man of Genesis 2. The female of Genesis 1 is the woman of Genesis 2. There's no confusion. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Moms and dads in this room, this is a real situation and it's something you need to talk to your children about as they reach that level. By the way, that level is getting younger and younger. Number five, I think another area in which Satan is attacking Christian homes is we have some millennials today that absolutely do not like children. Now, I'm going to show you a, a Facebook page, and I need to kind of give you a little bit of backstory to it. This is a young lady whose father was a preacher in the church, also an elder in the church. She is in her late 20s. She's celebrating the fact that she says, now it's less than a month till my tubes are tied. She does not have children. In fact, she's kind of got a, a little cartoon there saying, I don't want kids and that's okay. Here was the surprising part to me. Her sister who had at one stage in life actually babysitted my two sons when they were very small. My wife and I would have date nights. She would come over. She was at Faulkner University. She responds this way. She says, yeah, they change your whole life. Exactly. But what if I like my life? Okay, well, here's the problem with that. This sister, she has children. And yet, she's put out on the internet, she liked her life before she had children. What's going to happen when her kids get old enough to go back and look at mom's social media and, you know, they're laughing at old pictures of mom because mom had that funny hairdo and mom wore those funny clothes. And it, Ma, what do you mean you liked your life before? The reality is, millennials don't want kids. Now, obviously I'm generalizing, but the numbers are going down. More and more families, quite literally, don't like children. Birth rates in the United States of America have fallen to the lowest level in 32 years. 32 years. Now again, why is that a big deal? 
Folks, that's a huge deal because according to Scripture, we in this room should be viewing children as a reward. We shouldn't be going on social media going, what if I liked my life before children? No, we should look at children and go, you know what? They're a blessing. They're a reward from God. Are there times where I sit at home and my children, I think, oh, they're driving me crazy? Yeah, absolutely. And if you're a parent and haven't experienced that, I want to talk to you. I want to know how you got there. But you know what? At the end of the day, even when they're driving me crazy, I love them. They're my children. And according to this right here, I should be viewing them as a reward. And yet, too many people view them as a hindrance to more stuff. I, if I have more children, guess what? I can't get a new car. I, I can't get that vacation home. I can't get, and you can fill in the blank. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10 says, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. 3 John chapter 1, verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Folks, if the church is going to continue into the next generations, we need to hear the sounds of babies crying in this room right here. Last but not least, I think one of the ways in which Satan is choking out Christian homes is he's directly attacking the institution of marriage. Multiple ways he's doing it. One of the most obvious, he's encouraging infidelity, adultery. Now, I put this on the screen not because I want you to go there and not because I'm supporting it anyway, but I want you to realize there are now sites, clubs, so to speak, where you can join this club with the intent of committing adultery. In fact, look at their tagline. Life is short, have an affair. Why is it a big deal? They've got over 37 million members in this particular one. Or how about this street sign? Thou shalt, notice they've crossed out, not commit adultery. Folks, you want to talk about direct attacks on the institution of marriage? Matthew chapter 19, verse 6 says this, So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The people who started those little abomination clubs are going to have to give an account one day. You think about it for just a minute. The founders of Ashley Madison, of all the groups that people are flocking to, they will bend a knee one day and give an account to God about the fact that they have separated what God put together. It's under attack, and we need to understand if we're going to protect our homes, we've got to make sure and protect our marriages. If I had unlimited time, I would add a couple more. And the reason I would add a couple more is because like some people have shown me, talked to me about, octopuses have eight legs. I only gave you six. But I think you get the point. That our homes are being choked out by the world. And it's time that we stand up. Number one, it's time that Christian parents make sure they know the truth. So they are walking in the narrow path. But it's also time that we have some real discussions with our young people. Church, I don't think we've done a great job in Bible class over the last 50 years. And the reason I say that is because we have sent our kids off to Bible class where they have color cut and pasted the same Bible stories over and over and over. 
I actually had my daughter one time. She asked me this question. She said, Dad, when are we going to stop talking about Daniel in the lion's den, Noah in the flood, and baby Jesus? Let me make sure you understand. Those are important because that's a part of God's word. But so are things like marriage. So are the minor prophets. So are the abominations. These six things doth the Lord hate, Proverbs chapter 6. Our kids need to do more than just color, cut, and paste. Because right now, it's dark out there. Let's get back to those boys. You thought I forgot them. They have been in the back of that cave for roughly nine days. Problem that they're facing is when those two Navy SEALs came up out of the water, one of the things they had with them was a little instrument that measured the oxygen in the back of that cave. In order for your brain to function properly, you need somewhere between 19 and 23% oxygen in the air. By the time those boys had been found, the oxygen level was already at 15%. Here's what that really means. That means there wasn't enough oxygen for their brains to really be functioning properly. And pretty soon, their brains would start shutting down. Now, you look at me and you say, but it's okay because those two divers came, they found them, they get them out. Yeah, the problem with that is it took Navy SEALs six hours to get to them. You're talking 11, 12, 13-year-old boys, some of whom couldn't swim. Most all of whom certainly had no experience with scuba gear. What do you do? How do you get them out? Add to that, the monsoon rains kept coming. This thing turned into a worldwide event. Do we wait? Do we go after them? Can we pump the water out? The decision was finally made because they realized oxygen levels going down, water's coming up, we gotta go. We gotta go get them. And I am happy to stand before you this evening and tell you that after 18 long days in that cave, every single one of those boys made it out alive, including their coach. Every single one of them. In fact, it was the very first time in history that they had ever put children to sleep, strapped scuba gear on them, and then swam them out. They actually injected them with ketamine. They put the boys to sleep. Now, I personally, that would kind of freak me out. I'd already be freaked out to be in a cave that long. But if somebody says, now what we're going to do is put you to sleep and we're going to swim you, I'd be like, okay, no, just no. All of them made it out alive. Now, it wasn't without a couple of costs. In fact, the man that you see on the screen behind me, his name was Simon Kunin. If I were to mention his name to you tonight as I started this lesson, it would mean nothing to you. But in Thailand, there are monuments to him. He perished in the cave. He perished after staging oxygen canisters all throughout the cave for those boys. They knew that they couldn't get through a six-hour journey with just one tank. They needed multiple tanks. And so what Simon was doing was he was helping stage oxygen canisters. He got disoriented and eventually lost consciousness and died. Why do I bring this up? I bring it up because, as I said earlier, it's awfully dark out there. And my fear is that some of you know that there are people who are lost in the darkness and you think sitting in a pew is going to be enough. My fear is that some of you, <laughs> some of you think that being a good example is enough. Well, I'm just going to convert them with my good example. Let's try that on for a second. How about those Navy SEALs? Had they just walked back and forth in front of that cave entrance and said, you know what, I'm, gonna be, I'm a good example. Look at me. I'm a good example. Folks, if they never went in, 
if they never made the decision to go, the boys would perish. My fear is that some of you, some of you in this room may be very thankful that you're not the one sitting in darkness and you've grown comfortable. My fear is that some of you really don't want to get your hands dirty. My fear is that some of you, some of you that I'm looking at right now are content just to let somebody else do it. Oh, that's the preacher's job. We pay him. That's the elder's job. <laughs> that's the deacon's job. Last time I checked, if you wear the name of Christ, you are to take up your cross and follow after him. You are to go and make disciples. My fear is some of you don't see the urgency. And some of you have forgotten who it was that saved you from the darkness. See, we don't talk about this church, but some of you in this room, in the darkest recesses of your own heart, you realize you haven't been trying to save people in the darkness, but rather here's what's really happened is you've actually wandered yourself into the cave. And now instead of you being a rescuer, you're in need of rescue. One final question for you to think about tonight. How many of our children are still in the darkness? How many are going to remain in the darkness and how long are we going to allow them to stay there? Right now, Satan is doing everything he can to choke out your family. He's using every weapon he's got, whether it's pornography, attacking your marriage, whether it's trying to confuse your child with his gender. He's doing everything he can to make sure they're in the darkness. I am begging you to hold up your light as bright as you can for your family. I'm begging you tonight. If you're a Christian and you're in this room and you realize, you know what? I haven't really been proactive. I, I haven't been working with my kids enough. I haven't been the spouse I need to be. And I certainly haven't been evangelizing like I should. Please make a change tonight. This has been advertised as a gospel meeting. And I can remember a time in gospel meetings where somebody would extend the invitation and there would be quite literally dozens of people coming forward. My question is, have we hardened our hearts so much that when we hear God's word, it no longer penetrates? We're about to sing an invitation song. If you're not a Christian, we want you to change that tonight. Because ultimately what that means is you are still lost in the darkness. We want you to obey the light of God's word. Not what some man says, but rather what the Bible says. And so if you understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins, you're ready, you're willing to repent, to get on that narrow path, to change your ways in such a way that you're now aligned with him. You count the cost. You're ready to pick up your cross and follow after him. Confess his name so that one day he will confess you before the Father. And if you're ready to be baptized for the mission of your sins, you can do that tonight. But this evening, hopefully most everybody in this room understands this lesson wasn't intended for those out in the darkness. This lesson was for people who are in the light who need to be going and taking that light to the darkness. If you're in this room and you realize you need to make some changes, Maybe you need prayers for strength. Maybe you just haven't worked with your children the way you should. Maybe you haven't given the blueprint of marriage to your children the way you should. Or maybe you just realize you've kind of grown comfortable and lukewarm in your pew. Please have the courage tonight to come as together we stand and we sing.